Okay, sorry for this. Uh, well then, again, uh, uh, welcome. And um, uh, this is the second lecture on the concept of Tiangsha. Um, we had a first one <clears throat> in September uh, when uh, Chao Ting Yang, and I think most of you uh, joined that lecture, um, presented his ideas of uh, the uh, Tiangsha All Under Heaven uh, concept, uh, which he has published on widely in many articles and books. Um, and he presented uh, the core ideas of his concept. And we started discussing, but uh, I asked uh, three more um, uh, um, researchers uh, to comment on, uh, on Tao's understanding of Changsha, but on the overall idea of this uh, concept. Uh, as well and present their own ideas and research to us. And I uh, am very happy that um, the first one to do so now is uh, Stephen Engel um, from uh, the US, from Wesleyan University in, in Connecticut, US. Uh, welcome, Steve, and thanks a lot for accepting this uh, invitation. Um, you have already published um, not only on the concept of Tiangsha, but also on Cao's uh, understanding of it, and uh, uh, quite, uh, quite an expert in uh, the um, <clears throat> Chinese roots uh, and different, different uh, influences uh, on this concept. Let me briefly introduce Stephen Angler to you. He's a director of the Free Center for Global Studies a professor of philosophy and Mansfield Freeman professor at, uh, of East Asian studies at Wesleyan University in Connecticut, US. He's a special, specialist in Chinese philosophy, Confucianism, Neo-Confucianism and comparative philosophy and thematically his research mostly focuses on philosophy's role on human rights, politics and ethics, both in China and globally. Uh, he, uh, he, he's fluent in, um, uh, in Chinese language and he spent uh, uh, some years in as well Taipei as Beijing and was background fellow uh, at the Qing, Tsinghua University, is that correctly pronounced, uh, in 2016-17. Um, he has published widely on, uh, on Chinese philosophy, Confucianism, let me just uh, mention his latest book, uh, which is called Growing Moral, A Confucian Guide to Life, uh, just published uh, in uh, 2022. Many of his books have been translated uh, to uh, Chinese languages. All right, um, uh, I leave it there. Uh, there's lots more to say, but we are, we are, we are, we are here to listen to you. Um, uh, thank you for accepting this invitation and the floor is yours, Steve. Okay, Niels, thank you so much. Um, I have to say, uh, although we've been doing this for um, quite a while now, it's still sort of cool to be talking to you all uh, via this platform. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't even know where you all are located around the world, but uh, um, it's, uh, it's really a, a pleasure to be here. And I will I'll make some remarks, but I'm very interested in in hearing from you all, hear, hearing your feedback, having an opportunity to 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 chat. Um, so let's see. I am going to see if I can share my screen here. Okay, did that work? Um, why is that small? All right. So do, you can see that, right? Yeah, we can see without problem, but it's uh, it's indeed it's just a um, part that? of the, yeah. Now it's getting yeah. there. We go. There yeah. we go. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so the the, uh, the title of my remarks is the limits of Tianxia, and I'll explain what I mean by that uh, as we go. So here's an overview. I'm going to begin by. Um, uh, invoking uh, some ideas from Zha Ting Yang uh, that I very much endorse um, uh, and that I have drawn on to some degree in my own work, then turn to some methodological questions where 
I guess I think that there is a certain amount of ambiguity in Giles' work. And it's this is something that I've thought about a lot in terms of how one can pursue philosophy in a uh, cross-cultural um, comparative vein. Uh, and so offer some of my own thoughts uh, on, on a, a methodology here and suggest that one sense in which Tianxia is limited is this methodological uh, sense. We'll see as I'm getting into this that there's, uh, Zhao is interested in human rights and human rights offer an interesting comparison case to the idea of Tianxia in part because as Zhao himself uh, recognizes human rights is a concept that has uh, largely emerged from, uh, from the context of Europe, um, but has become applicable worldwide. And he's hoping that Tianxia is a concept that can emerge from China and become applicable worldwide. Try using those words sort of purposely vaguely, what it means to be, to be applicable worldwide. Uh, and so thinking about uh, the comparison with human rights, I think is valuable in terms of how we understand the potential role of Tianxia. I'm gonna talk not just about human rights uh, in general, but in particular, how Confucians might approach human rights. Um, uh, and I think hopefully you'll see why that's relevant. We'll come back to this idea of Tianxia or uh, all under heaven um, uh, towards the end as I develop this way of thinking about human rights from a Confucian, from a, a contemporary Confucian standpoint. And then there's gonna end up being a second sense in which Tianxia is limited. Um, uh, and I'll argue that that is by, in fact, by human rights. So if everything works, that's how we're gonna uh, spend the next, I don't know, 45 minutes, something like that, hour, I don't know, we'll see. So I think Zhao is a really, um, uh, interesting provocative philosopher. And I have enjoyed engaging with his work over the years. Um, the, uh, this book, uh, All Under Heaven, The Tianxia System for a Possible World Order um, is a uh, very recent translation of a 2016 uh, book by, uh, by Zhao. Um, and it's really a fantastic translation. Um, so it's a, it's a great entry point to, to Zhao's work and I think in many ways superior to some of the uh, access that we've had to, uh, to Zhao's work prior to this. Uh, so that's, uh, I recently uh, read that to sort of prepare for this, for this talk. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's really terrific. So some of the ideas that Zhao brings out there uh, are um, the contrast between uh, a possible world and an impossible world. Um, uh, for him, a possible world is one that does not uh, sort of prescind from or transcend away from human affect. Um, uh, and so, although, right, those of you who were at the uh, talk a month ago or who are familiar with Zhao's work know that there is something that seems uh, uh, quite utopian about his, his thoughts about Tianxia, or contopian, as he said last month. Um, the he, in, in a number of ways, is, is emphasizing that uh, there is a certain amount of realism uh, about, about humanity that's involved in, in his thinking. And so he makes this distinction between a possible world and an impossible world. Um, uh, and I think it's important to continue to take human affect very seriously. Um, so that's one thing that uh, we'll sort of circle back to. A second thing, and I think this comes out perhaps more clearly in his recent work than it, than it did originally is the limited goal of any kind of political arrangement. Um, uh, so he says in a number of different ways that uh, his Tianxia framework, although again, it seems very ambitious, um, uh, is still really only aimed at sort of uh, uh, security, peace, um, and a kind of a baseline for human interactions. It does not guarantee happiness, flourishing, um, uh, anything like that. And I think that that sense of the, the limited aspirations of political arrangements is also uh, something that I would endorse. Why are we able to talk about Tianxia 
um, uh, and why are in particular we, uh, those of us um, uh, on this on this Zoom call right now, able to talk about Tianxia? Well, um, uh, he points out that globalization, meaning that in all senses, but certainly includes including the problematic uh, sides of globalization, um, uh, is partly responsible for the new opportunities that we have to engage with one another across great distances, um, uh, in, even across languages, um, uh, and so on and so forth. So globalization is uh, an important sort of premise for being able to think today. Um, uh, but it also obviously has caused problems and thrown existing problems into relief. So that is a uh, Another point that uh, the Zhao makes that seems to me to be um, uh, dead on. So Zhao's general approach is to draw on Chinese ideas, but to develop them in uh, this new contemporary context. Um, he, one uh, possibly minor, I'm not sure how big of a difference this is, how important of a difference this is between him uh, and the way I'm approaching these things is he is, uh, uh, so, I think of my work as developing contemporary Confucianism. So I think of myself as a Confucian philosopher and working out of that philosophical tradition. Um, Zhao is uh, more ecumenical. Um, uh, he draws important ideas from uh, early Chinese Taoism, um, uh, from uh, other aspects of, uh, of Chinese thinking. At the center of most of what he's talking about, I would argue are, uh, uh, Confucian ideas and the Confucian tradition, but he's not self-consciously identifying as a Confucian. Maybe that matters. We can talk more about that. Um, but broadly, what he's doing is very similar to what I'm trying to do. And I think that, uh, so modeling in some ways on his work. Um, he also makes a distinction between the Tianxia ideal of the ancient Zhou dynasty. So this is uh, uh, even pre-Confucius um, as versus the way that the Tianxia uh, that the term Tianxia was, was employed and the practices that it labeled that developed from the Han Dynasty on. And uh, this is, I think, uh, a very important, something he makes extremely clear, uh, especially in his recent work. Um, and this is, this is important because the sort of better known practice of Tianxia is well, the last 2000 years or, or uh, maybe uh, something like that uh, of Tianxia, where you think of um, uh, sort of this, the, the Middle Kingdom's relationship with uh, uh, other states outside it and with them sort of owing some kind of, uh, some kind of fealty uh, to the Central Kingdom. Uh, that's not the idea of Tianxia that he's working with. That is a uh, a sort of a development or maybe even a, uh, a devolution of the original Tianxia idea in his telling. Um, and I think that there is, uh, uh, there really is some, uh, some truth to that, that, that there's a difference between the, the Zhou dynasty, uh, which did not think of itself um, uh, as sort of a central state with respect to other states, but the Tianxia concept uh, at that point was meant to encompass the world, uh, all under heaven, um, uh, and in, in a sort of different way, I think, than, than later on. And so some of the criticisms that uh, Zhao has faced over the years for trying to uh, promote a China-centered view of the international order, um, uh, I think, are mistaken. I think probably have always been mistaken, but it, uh, but there is, you know, his, his ideas have developed over time. Um, uh, and so it's at least clearer now that that's not what he's talking about. Um, and I think one more thing, yeah. Uh, and then the last thing is that there is a um, very central idea in, uh, in Confucianism uh, that we start from the family, Really, in many ways, we start from the individual, um, uh, ex extend out to the family, extend out to the state, and, ev and eventually extend out to Tianxia. Um, uh, so individual cultivation um, in the context of, of uh, family and, and uh, local society, um, to the extent that that's successful, um, that will then shape the state, 
uh, to the extent that's successful, then that can influence Tianxia. Um, uh, that's the general way, the sort of bottom up way that, that Confucians think about uh, moral development leading into sort of political change. And that's, I think, evident in uh, lots of early texts. So one of uh, Zhao's explicit arguments is that he likes this idea, but it's insufficient. Um, uh, he thinks there actually needs to be sort of a, uh, a cycle um, where this family state to Tianxia uh, direction is then somehow uh, joined with, um, I don't know, dialectically, um, a Tianxia two state, two family direction. Um, uh, in other words, a uh, sort of inward out uh, process is coupled um, cyclically maybe, or uh, uh, exactly how this is supposed to work is a little, is a little fuzzy, but uh, uh, with a outward in process. Um, in other words, with more sort of external control. Um, uh, and um, I think that this, this the, the general insight as I understand it is also um, uh, important and will feature in what I have to say in a few minutes. Okay, so, um, so I think that's all great and uh, 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 represents a lot of insight. All right, let's turn now to some methodological questions. In Zhao's early work, he calls for what he, uh, the, the term he uses is rethinking China, um, uh, and I think this, this slogan of rethinking China is, is very provocative, um, uh, is very generative, um, uh, it means in part to, uh, to restore China to uh, a place where it has a role in creating theory, in thinking, um, uh, as opposed to just being something that is thought about, right? So uh, for, um, uh, for the last couple hundred years, primarily China has been um, a, uh, sort of something that we theorize about as opposed to a source of theorizing. Um, uh, and to a great extent, this is still true. If you go to a philosophy department uh, in China today and look at what the, uh, the, the philosophers there are using, what, what are they drawing upon for their theory? Um, uh, in many cases, in most cases, I would say, they're not drawing on Chinese theory. Um, uh, they're drawing on European philosophy, um, uh, uh, and other kinds of uh, contemporary theory uh, uh, that derive largely from Europe to some degree from North America. Um, uh, those who are talking about Chinese traditions are mostly not doing so as sources of theory as much as um, they're doing intellectual histor historical work. Um, uh, so the call to, uh, to begin again this process of theorizing um, uh, from China instead of just about China, it seems, seems to me to be super important. Um, one of the things that requires is rethinking some of the uh, philosophical uh, value uh, commitments of the Chinese traditions. Um, uh, so to, in order to restart this thinking, it requires another sense of rethinking. So that's all, I think that's all um, terrific. Uh, the um, and it's similar, I think, in some ways uh, to the approach that I've called rooted global philosophy, um, uh, which is to um, uh, philosophize from some from within some tradition rooted in some place and and context and language, um, uh, but to do so in a way that is open to uh, stimulus, insights, catalysts, challenges, and so on and so forth from around the world. Um, so the rootedness, right, is uh, very connected up with this idea of uh, rethinking China, um, and the and the rethinking part, the the changing ideas and so on, uh, is connected to the global part. So back when uh, I first encountered Zhao, uh, I very much thought of us methodologically as on the same um, uh, thinking along the same lines. In uh, his uh, more recent work. Um, I'm not so sure anymore. Um, uh, so the idea of Tianxia is to really take Tianxia, to, to, uh, to take the world as 
uh, the subject of uh, politics. Um, uh, he, he uses this phrase, the world thinking for itself. Um, uh, and at a certain point uh, in, in this uh, 2016 book, um, uh, he, he talks about his effort to, in his theorizing, not to take sides and even imagines that you know, the, the work that he's doing could have been the fruits of an alien anthropologist coming down from a, you know, and, and, and sort of just observing things. This seems to me to be um, uh, going too far in the direction of sort of a, what uh, Nagel once called the view from nowhere. Um, uh, the, uh, there's a, I think there's a, it's possible that we could achieve a world thinking for itself, but we certainly aren't there now. Um, uh, and so I think this is this is misleading and potentially problematic insofar as it represents something different from what I had understood rethinking China to be about in the first place. After all, the world thinking for itself depends, I would say, on an equitable community of world thinkers, presumably multilingual world thinkers, actually thinking together. Um, uh, this is something that is uh, increasingly possible in certain ways, right? I mean, this very seminar represents a certain uh, uh, a sort of gesture in that direction. Um, uh, but I think it's very difficult to suggest that we're already at the point of having the sort of the world thinking for itself. Um, uh, we need a lot more, uh, a lot more effort, a lot more um, uh, sort of training and mutual understanding and so on and so forth to get to the point that we can have those sorts of conversations. Again, as, as wonderful an example as this is uh, what we're doing here today. Um, it's also not entirely clear um, uh, whom, if you, know, if you think of this as this uh, a sort of uh, the world thinking for itself as world philosophers getting together and in a, in a seminar room or in a Zoom room and having these conversations, um, that it, uh, which are presumably influencing one another, right? So there's the, the world thinking for itself would involve the constituents of the world coming to change their minds. Um, uh, and so the world collectively changing its mind as it were. But how much is that just a certain elite group um, uh, thinking for itself? Um, uh, that I'm not so sure about. So anyways, this is all to say that maybe we can uh, uh, sort of conceptualize what this world thinking for itself would be, I think it's not the same as an alien anthropologist, because I think the thinking has to be a dynamic process in which we engage with one another. Um, uh, and so I want to encourage uh, 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 Professor Zhao going forward uh, to go back to that great idea of rethinking China um, uh, as the basis for his, his approach here. Um, and then we can work on the, on the world. He says, in fact, uh, that the concept of Tianxia comes from China, but now belongs to the world, just as human rights comes from Europe and now belongs to the world. I've already referenced this, and it's a sort of a key thought in behind the way that I've structured this talk. I think that's right. But what it means that uh, a concept now belongs to the world is, I think, um, uh, pretty tricky, and we need to figure that out. It's, a, it's not something that just happens. It's, a, it's a, at best a kind of a, a process. So I've been emphasizing that one of the things that rethinking means is to develop, um, uh, to change one's mind about certain things that, that, that uh, one's tradition had, uh, had previously held. Um, and so this, in, in, in my context, the label that I've put on that is progressive Confucianism. Um, uh, the taking seriously the, that, modernity has happened and that the, all, all the changes that is brought, the challenges that is brought, the problems that is, that, that is brought. So what it is to be a Confucian today is, is importantly different from what it, it, what it would have been to be a Confucian a couple hundred years ago. Um, there's a, it's a, I've done a lot of work in that vein and I'm gonna be uh, drawing on that to some degree here today. One aspect of this is to think of Confucianism as in part, not exclusively, but in part as a philosophy in the way that that term has, uh, more or less in the way that that term has come to be understood in the context of global research universities and disciplines and so on and so forth. Although there are certain ways in which I'm critical of, uh, of those developments 
and I think philosophy needs to um, uh, to change to some degree as well. But uh, that's probably going to get beyond our our scope for today. Um, and uh, so finally, you know, to, to bring me back to my title, it seems to me that an important limit of Tian Xia is that we need to be clear about uh, where this concept is emerging from and how it becomes so-called of the world. Um, uh, so that's, I think, not sufficiently clear um, uh, in the way that uh, that, that uh, Professor Zhao was thinking about it today. Um, and that is, there's a lesson there for all of us in trying to engage in some kind of intercultural philosophy, cross-cultural philosophy, um, uh, and so on. We need to be limited in this same way. All righty. So I'm going to talk about Confucianism and human rights uh, for much of the rest of the talk. And to frame that, I want to put forward, I think, five different ways that Confucianism might relate to human rights. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm only going to then talk about the last one, <laughs> but to give you a sense of some of the uh, of the, the context, some of the ways in which one might approach this and to, to, uh, to contextualize my own approach. One possibility, which I think is false, <laughs> but one possibility that some people have argued for um, uh, is that Confucianism has recognized human rights from the beginning. Um, uh, and I think that in order to make this case, one has to have a such a um, sort of vague notion of human rights um, uh, as to have drained the concept of all meaning <laughs> or virtually all meaning. But some people have said this, it's there already. We can find it in the mentions or whatever it is. Um, uh, uh, so I don't think this is true. If it were true, then Confucians and even a hypothetical modern Confucian polity would have no difficulty endorsing human rights today, if it's been there all along, right? Um, I don't think that's the case. So another position, again, something that uh, people hold and maybe is less implausible than the first one, is that Confucianism is simply incompatible with human rights. Um, uh, and uh, therefore, we should reject human rights. Or we Confucians, right, should reject human rights. Um, uh, it's a problematic parochial Western uh, sort of uh, framework. Um, uh, Confucianism uh, cannot be made compatible with it, and it has its own ways of dealing with, you know, blah blah blah. There's got to be a whole story. Um, uh, so that is uh, a view that I think uh, some very conservative Confucians today might hold. Um, so that was the incompatible view. Um, so another view is that Confucianism did not historically develop a doctrine of human rights, but it's compatible with such an idea. Um, so human rights don't come from Confucianism in any sense, uh, but uh, it can coexist. There's nothing in Confucianism uh, that forces us to reject human rights. Um, uh, so if we want to, for independent reasons, um, uh, we can endorse it alongside our Confucian thinking. Um, number four. Uh, so again, I don't, not, not, none of these I'm, I'm, uh, I'm liking. Number four, Confucianism did not historically develop a doctrine of human rights. And it's necessary uh, uh, that it, let's see here, right. It's necessary that it now develop the resources to do so, and the result will be transforming Confucianism into Western liberalism. <laughs> uh, so Confucianism as a distinct philosophical position will cease to exist. Another version of this would be that Confucianism did not historically develop such a doctrine. It's incompatible with it. We need human rights, and so we reject human rights. Uh, that uh, maybe if I had wanted to have six of these, I could have put that in, but it's this same upshot. Uh, as we have in this case. Either we reject human rights, uh, sorry, we re reject Confucianism, or we transform Confucianism to such a degree that it is no longer Confucianism. Uh, it's just become liberalism. Um, this is also something that people think. Here's what I think. <laughs> um, uh, Confucianism did not historically develop a doctrine of human rights. But in order to realize its own core commitments, it is necessary that it now develop the resources to do so. 
Okay. In some ways, this is the theoretically most um, uh, challenging of all of these positions, right? Compatible, incompatible, you know, that, that, I think that's relatively simple to understand. The idea here is that while Confucianism didn't historically develop um, uh, the idea of human rights, I guess the a premise of this uh, is that it, it can now develop such an idea um, uh, without ceasing to be Confucianism. And it's necessary that it now develop this idea for its own reasons, right? Um, uh, and so that's the, uh, I think, rather uh, uh, intriguing idea and appealing idea that I wanna um, uh, turn to. This is gonna be a, a way of, again, offering a parallel to thinking about um, uh, bringing an idea um, uh, to the whole world. In this case, um, uh, the emphasis on, is on the degree to which we're bringing it to Confucianism. Although, well, you'll see it's also, the, whole, the world comes back in. Um, Okay, so that's what I'm going to be trying to show. So, in some of his early work um, on uh, Tianxia, uh, Zhao Tingyang emphasizes the failures of the international system. Um, uh, he makes some remarks uh, that I think are um, uh, probably quite widely agreed with about. Well, if you, even if you don't want to put it in terms of failures, in terms of the, the dramatic limitation to the international human rights regime because of its dependence on individual nations. Um, uh, so with a few partial only uh, semi-successful exceptions, um, such as maybe the responsibility to protect doctrine and things like that, that have tried to limit the uh, uh, national sovereignty, um, uh, for the most part, the way that the international human rights regime has developed is um, uh, is relying on these individual in nations, uh, nation states, um, uh, to endorse, to play along, and insofar as they don't want to, there's nothing much that the UN or um, treaty bodies can do about it. Um, uh, and that means, I think, clearly, that the this uh, human rights regime is quite limited. Um, uh, it has not succeeded in ending violations of human rights around the world by a long shot. Um, uh, so this is a core uh, uh, starting point for, for Zhao's uh, desire to develop an idea of Tianxia, um, uh, an idea of the world for the world rather than individual countries sort of in practically in a state of nature um, uh, with respect to one another having some interest in the world, but really not very much. Um, so thinking through Zhao's criticisms um, uh, and his this idea of, uh, of, of Tianxia, of all under heaven, uh, led me in some earlier work to articulate the idea of the rights of all under heaven as a Confucian version of human rights. Um, so, Got to back up now a little bit, because in doing so, so Zhao is uh, is one one inspiration uh, for my work, but a, a sort of a deeper um, and more pervasive insp inspiration for uh, for a lot of my work is the 20th century Confucian philosopher Mo Zongshan, um, and in there Mo wrote a lot of things, said a lot of things. I am uh, persuaded by some of them and uh, not by others, but. Um, the, at the, the core idea uh, that really, really, I think, um, uh, is, is necessary for, uh, for Confucians in the contemporary world. And in fact, I think that this is a, a, an idea that, that applies quite, quite generally, particularly to any philosophy whose ethic is in the sort of virtue ethics um, uh, vein. Um, uh, so I don't even remember how I began the sentence. Um, uh, let me let me start anew. Uh, so um, Mo argues uh, that there is a independent kind of authority, a kind of restriction um, that uh, coming from law um, and both domestic and or human rights uh, that is necessary for 
people to actually become virtuous. All right. Um, uh, so uh, the a core Confucian commitment is the idea that we should be striving to become sages. That is, we should be striving to become perfectly virtuous. Now, parenthetically, Confucianism doesn't care very much that we don't, we're not all perfectly virtuous. In fact, none of us are perfectly virtuous. In principle, we could be in some sense, but the point is that we need to be working to become more virtuous than we are. Um, uh, and in order for that process to continue, in order for people to have the genuine possibility of achieving um, uh, virtue, Mo argues that law and human rights are necessary. So this is a big innovation in the context of Confucianism. For the most part, Confucians are not fans of law. Um, and as I said, didn't even talk about human rights. Um, uh, so this is a, a, a central idea that I'm gonna be um, developing with you for uh, a few minutes. In the context of uh, making this argument, Mo articulates his own understanding of Tianxia. So Tianxia is an important concept for Mo. Um, uh, he says uh, that, so it's very broad, right? It's uh, the, the world, uh, it's this uh, very inclusive thing. Um, uh, but for him, it's not an abstraction, um, uh, but what he calls drawing on uh, Hegel and others, uh, a concrete universal, um, uh, a unit composed out of the practical lives of states. Um, uh, and I think that this is uh, really also quite compatible with Zhao's understanding of, uh, of Tianxia. It's, I think it's not an abstraction. It is the, the actual world in a way. Um, and furthermore, this, this uh, extremely inclusive uh, concrete universal, this, this unit only has meaning for Mo um, uh, because it emerges out of the interactions of lower level concrete units like states and families. Um, so he has this uh, uh, vision of um, uh, uh, families, states interacting with one another and out of this interaction emerges the, the, uh, the concrete universal of, the, of Tianxia, right? Um, uh, it is, so this practical reality um, or concreteness of Tianxia uh, I think is important in ways, hopefully, that will be clear. Okay. So how much do I have to say about self-restriction? Um, uh, maybe I won't say too much right now. Um, uh, the, the general, so this is the sort of the, the philosophical core of Mo's argument for the necessity for law and human rights. Um, uh, the idea is basically this, that to become virtuous is something that each individual has to achieve for themselves. I can't make you virtuous. The state can't make you virtuous. You need to become virtuous on, um, uh, of your own doing. Now that doesn't mean that the context of friends, teachers, uh, family, state, and so on and so forth don't matter. Of course, they matter enormously. Um, uh, and in the wrong context, it may be impossible for somebody to become, uh, uh, to make any progress at all, much less to become fully virtuous. But ultimately, uh, one needs to do, to do this oneself. And therefore, it's fundamentally important that others restrict their uh, sort of impositions upon uh, one another. Um, uh, so uh, if, um, if I have some kind of uh, recognition of how the world or, or just how, how uh, my community should be organized and somehow have the ability to make that happen. So I'm powerful and I have, a gr have great insight. If I just make it happen, um, uh, then I'm taking agency and up opportunities for moral development away from the other members of the community. Um, uh, and so because that agency is, is, is critical from a Confucian perspective, right? If, if uh, so Mo's argument is to show because Confucians care about the cultivation of virtue, 
Therefore, they need to recognize the importance of self-restriction. Um, uh, one of the ways he puts this is even a sage can't violate the constitution. Put a, you know, so he's not a fan of the idea of uh, sort of universally powerful sage kings. Um, uh, he thinks that in fact, the, the core Confucian commitments to moral development are more readily realizable in a democracy um, uh, than in an autocracy, as was historically, uh, uh, always, of course, always the context. So we'll see whether we need to <laughs> go more into that. Um, uh, part of the idea of self-restriction then is a distinction between moral and political authority, moral and political values. Um, uh, there needs to be a uh, separate sphere of political, um, uh, political values, political norms, political practices um, uh, that is not just um, up to an individual's moral sort of uh, judgment to ignore, right? So the, the restriction is the restriction from uh, what I'm calling here political values laws, uh, 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 political institutions, if you like. Um, and, uh, and this distinction is important, but it's also the case that the political institutions are limited, right? The political institutions have to be there in order for individuals to be able to achieve um, uh, moral development, but they aren't on their own causing the people to achieve moral development, right? So we have a principal distinction um, uh, that both indicates the necessity, but also the limitation of political uh, institutions. And I think human rights are a great example of this. Without protection for human rights, um, uh, individual moral development is very challenging, but the realization of human rights is not tantamount to the realization of full virtue or human flourishing, right? Um, we want much more for, from our lives than simply not being tortured, right? You're not living a good life if you're not being tortured. If you are being tortured, it may be very difficult to live a good life. All righty. Um, so part of this for, uh, for Mo, um, uh, right? He says that the, um, that the concept of all under heaven of Tianxia is something that emerges out of actual interactions um, uh, among lower level units, nations and, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, and uh, so let's see, what's my next point here? Yeah, I'll go right on to this. So that means that for, for, for Mo, um, although he really doesn't get into this in any detail at all, um, he, he, he uses the word human rights, but he doesn't have much of a theory of human rights um, uh, explicitly, but he's provided a lot of the materials for one. Um, uh, so for Mo, human rights emerge from these, uh, these actual interactions and agreements um, on what the political values are among the, uh, the parties in the world. Um, uh, he says that if you don't do that, um, if you don't, um, uh, uh, if you sort of jump past actual um, interactions and engagements, then what you get is something called morality swallowing politics. So if someone says, I know what the human rights are or whatever, um, uh, based on my great moral insight, um, uh, and I'm then going to try to impose that on, on, on the world, then the important work of actual politics has gone away. It's been swallowed up um, uh, by, uh, by morality, um, which might, you know, benevolent dictator, you know, might, might seem like a good thing, um, uh, but he thinks uh, that that is inimical to Confucianism's own purposes, whatever other problems there might be. And interestingly, this I think it is very much uh, similar to avoiding what Habermas calls human rights fundamentalism, right? Human rights fundamentalism for Habermas is um, on the basis of some kind of moral argument saying, here's what the human rights are and stipulating that um, uh, uh, rather than having the uh, our, our human rights emerge from an actual process um, 
uh, of, uh, of, of some kind of uh, negotiation, uh, debate, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, okay, so what does this mean then for the content of human rights? Or, or of, if you will, the rights of all under heaven. So Confucians today who are persuaded by this perspective, who think that Mo is correct, uh, that there has to be a distinction between moral and political values. We can't just conflate them all. Um, there has to be this actual process of, of, uh, of discussion, negotiation, and so on and so forth in order to arrive at a shared notion of the rights of all under heaven applying to everybody, right? So, uh, i.e. human rights. Um, uh, so a Confucian committed to these views would then also be committed to the idea that the content of the rights would not come solely or directly from pre-existing Confucian values. So on my telling, a Confucian committed to the rights of all under heaven is thereby committed to, it's a sort of open-ended question what the content is, um, uh, but is committed to not just saying, because of my Confucian insight, I can tell you what rights are necessary in order for people to uh, live minimally decent lives or however exactly you articulate that. Um, uh, and uh, and I think that's 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 uh, very important because a lot of folks writing about human rights from a Confucian um, uh, perspective, what they're doing is telling you, uh, here's what here's what Confucians think the human rights should be, and it seems to me that that is on this on this account that is mistaking what Confucians should think structurally human rights are. Not to say that Confucians can't have views, so. Confucians might be very interested in a human right to education, for example, um, uh, because of the centrality of uh, sort of learning um, and, and education in a Confucian perspective to um, uh, uh, what it is to be a sort of minimally flourishing human being um, uh, and so on. Um, rights of elders possibly, right? There's different sorts of things that, uh, uh, that people have said in this vein, um, uh, but the Confucians wouldn't be the only ones at the table. All right, so um, uh, I'm gonna sum up. I think this is my last slide and then look forward to uh, conversation. So I think that, uh, that uh, Professor Zhao has um, sort of mixed and, and developing views um, uh, about human rights. Um, uh, in some of his early writing, he's pretty critical and, and offers really a very, I think, uh, limited and somewhat problematic way of understanding uh, human rights. Uh, but if we think about Tianxia uh, as, a, um, as the actual world, right, the whole world, um, it seems clear uh, that we can't think of this just as um, on the model of, of simply of a democracy. Um, uh, where which would be subject to um, the tyranny of the majority. There need to be uh, limits imposed on Tianxia by Tianxia. Um, uh, and I would suggest that something like the, the, the rights of all under heaven or human rights, however you want to think about that, um, uh, therefore is a really important limit um, uh, of Tianxia. I, I suspect uh, that, that Professor Zhao is going to be sympathetic to this. Um, uh, after all, he himself is emphasizing the, the limits of Tianxia as a political concept. Um, uh, but at any rate, I think that needs to be made, made clear. Um, I'm, and then I'm gonna sort of suggest ways in which I think what I've done um, uh, does uh, draw on and echo those insights of, of, uh, of Giles that I began with. Um, so this, draws on but develops Chinese ideas. I think this is a way of uh, both, uh, of rethinking China in both senses um, uh, that I emphasized. The inward, outward, you know, the, the from, from inside out um, uh, sort of traditional Confucian um, uh, project of extension um, uh, is not enough on this account. There needs to be um, uh, 
external political institutions uh, that provide assurances that uh, each individual is able to have sufficient agency to develop themselves. Um, I think it's pretty clear how this um, uh, relates to globalization in the way that I um, uh, originally was posing. I think we're talking very much about real people um, uh, with real human affect. Um, obviously, Confucians think that we can tr transform our affects. Um, as we become more virtuous, we are changing our dispositions um, uh, so that we uh, are, uh, you know, at, according to the Analects, Confucius himself at age 70 was able to follow his heart's desires without overstepping the bounds. Um, uh, so there's affect there, but it's been transformed. And so that's part of the broader story that the Confucians tell. Um, but as far as this sort of notion of possible versus impossible world, um, uh, it, this is clearly a, a possible world. And I think one nice thing about this story that I've been telling um, uh, is that it points beyond the limited goal of politics to a human ideal of, uh, of sagehood. Um, I want to emphasize in closing that the idea is, I think nothing in what I've said depends on anyone ever actually achieving the full state of sagehood. Um, uh, this is a, uh, uh, an idea of human moral development um, uh, that has many stages. Um, uh, and the idea is, uh, and the, the core idea is simply that there is a way to be better than we are, than any, any one individual is right now. Um, wherever that individual is on the uh, sort of the path of moral growth, um, uh, and we should be striving to walk along that path to improve ourselves, to get closer to the ideal of sagehood. Um, uh, and that provides, I think, a, a, um, a, a quite compelling um, uh, goal, compelling vision of uh, human flourishing. All right, that's it. Stop share. Well, thank you so much, uh, Stephen, for this um, for this uh, very interesting, I think, uh, um, presentation, uh, which takes up some of the aspects um, uh, Cha Jing Yang already uh, um, hinted to, but uh, goes way beyond uh, um, uh, addressing uh, some Confucian, rather modern ideas of uh, Confucianism regarding the role of human rights, global politics, uh, the the um, uh, the striving for uh, this human ideal of sagehood uh, that you mentioned uh, in your last slide. Thanks a lot for this. Uh, 